I don't know the dimensions of a bore and stroke, but it's a, a Sullivan triple expansion steam engine. Same company that built the triple expansion steam engine in the uh, steam yacht Kangarda. Okay, take a look here. So, only pictures I got of the triple were ones that were on the auction site. I talked to one of the employees at the at Almond Auctions, uh, tried to get an idea of the bores and stroke. He didn't know really how to check the bore stroke. He gave me an estimate of about four inch stroke. Let me take a quick look at here. This is a triple extension engine. It's got piston valves on the high pressure, low pressure, and medium, or, or sorry, intermediate and low pressure. And it's slip eccentric, which is actually kind of unusual for the reversing gear. You can't really see it, but there's three eccentrics up there for each cylinder. And then there's this lay shaft here that transfers the, the motion from those to the, the valves. And that, at that eccentric, or those three eccentrics on our collar, that can s s slip and change the direction, or turn it 180 degrees and change the direction the engine is running. Uh, engine's pretty unusual. So far we got, looks like ball bearing, thrust bearings built in to the engine. Um, looks like adjustment that can be made for the stroke of the valve, so you can balance the, the valves. Looks like maybe some uh, farm repair or something like that, or looks like actually like a homemade um, valve stem guide, which is actually a good idea because valve stems are um, you know, there's this weird angle that this rod is pull, pulling on it and you could have eat up your packing or, or uh, the bushings for the, the uh, packing and the guide. So having a valve stem guide is actually a really good idea. You know, it's turn front columns, cast back columns. Let's take a look at the stroke here. So I'm going to try and guesstimate from the middle-ish of the throw to the middle-ish of the, the crank here. Looks like three and a half inches-ish. So if you take that, multiply by two, because the throw goes over here also, it's about a seven inch stroke. Um, I can also try turning it. Looks like the high pressure is almost all the way up there, only about an inch and a half showing there. It's at top dead center, and uh, low pressure and intermediate pressure are at 120 degrees off from that. You can just do a quick, cheesy lay measurement of that, and we're looking at from the from the packing gland down to that point. It's about five and three quarters. Looks like just another guesstimate. Um, I can turn it over here real quick and see if I can get a full measurement. Okay, good sign is it turns over pretty easily. Um, at least that last few degrees to get it to, last 60 degrees to get it to the uh, bottom dead center on the low pressure here. And then measuring now from the packing gland down to the witness mark on the valve, or the piston rod, it actually looks like seven and a half inch so a seven and a half inch stroke. Um, it'll be interesting. We'll measure the bores and uh, do calculations through the plan formula. And I'll put that on the screen what the plan formula is. and we'll try to figure out what the indicated horsepower of this would be or the and then we'll uh go from there beautiful engine it's cast back columns but they're really lightly like very thin casting so it's really lightly made it's, it's very rigid but also very lightly made you can see the throw the big end bearing there for the intermediate pressure is almost touching the frame so they max out the stroke for this engine they could look you can see the frame down there it's, it's only a quarter inch thick or so here and and the webs 
look like they're only about a quarter inch thick or so. They have what looks like a supporting foot underneath there to um, maybe support it in the, the frame of a boat. Um, really interesting. You see the maximum, try to maximize the, the length of the bearing cap there so you have maximum bearing support of your uh, of your crankshaft, same in the in the other webs. Um, you have fewer bearings because you have fewer um, fewer sets of eccentrics. Like if you had a Stevenson link valve motion, uh, you'd have multiple sets of eccentrics, a lot more moving parts, um, a lot more bearing surfaces that could wear a lot more. Um, you say a lot more friction, you know, etc. I can give you, I got this engine on a hunch. I mean, I was looking at the pictures. I saw this little, little valve here. I think it was this one on the gauge that I could see what size it was in the picture. And so then I had a similar valve and I, I measured it and then used it for a scale to measure how tall the, the cylinder was and the cylinder covers to just kind of get a general idea how big the engine was before I was able to get some outer outside dimensions. And this is almost almost three and a half, four feet tall and about five feet long. You can see the two levers back there. One is actually for a throttle and the other one is uses bevel gears and a, a shaft to um, reverse the engine. It's actually really interesting. It was kind of it looks like it's set up for single handling or or for a very simple uh, engineering station with very you know very positive controls. And I, I have a, an idea this engine reverses very easily and smoothly but let me uh I'm gonna set this up real quick and then I'll turn over the engine by hand and you can watch. See, I can hear a little bit of slop and some of the bearings there, as can be expected for an engine that's 120 years old or so. Uh, those will all be gone through and taken up. Uh, what needs to be renewed will be renewed. And see, this is really interesting here. The big end brass, the cap, it's using studs with uh, nuts, and the cap is rounded off on the bottom to save weight. Uh, I don't know much, if anything, about the Solvent Engine Company, but I can tell by looking at this engine, they were very aware and conscientious about weight savings and about low reciprocating mass. I mean, the rods are about the same in diameter, a little bit bigger than the rods that are in some more contemporary steam launch engines uh, um, with only a four inch stroke and a heck of a lot less horsepower. So, you know, you can tell the contemporary engines are built a lot heavier than they need to be for their output. Um, interesting note is the the die or the uh, wrist pin bearing. It looks like it kind of looks like maybe a wedge block in here with the adjustment screw to tighten the brasses for the wrist pin. Be interesting to see how that works when you pull it apart, but. Uh, I am wholly impressed so far with what I've seen this short bit. Um, look, like they've even underneath here, they've scalloped out the casting for the cylinder to reduce weight. You could put insulation up there if you want to, uh, like make it a little more thermally efficient also. What that shows me too is, you can see the bottom of the cylinder is way up there bottom of the valve chest is way down here so i'll show you a drawing but 
essentially looks like from that, and I'll confirm it once I pull cylinder heads off and stuff, that the steam ports are straight, and probably as short as possible. So in locomotive practice at the very end of the steam locomotive era, they were doing that where they had great big piston valves and their ports, the steam ports were absolutely as short as possible and as straight as possible. As any uh, turns and, and things like that in the ports only serve to slow the steam down and to when the steam exhausting goes to the same ports as the the live steam going into the engine. So anytime any time spent in that port as exhausting, which is cooler, it's already expanded, is uh, making the engine less thermally efficient, and that's also wasting time. You can't evacuate the cylinders or fill the cylinders fast enough. I mean, fast enough, but you know, we're trying to be as efficient as possible and trying to get as much power out of this as possible. So, wholly impressed so far. Here goes nothing. she be. Let's take you down here. Okay, You're all unpackaged. Just pull the cylinder head covers. Looks like there's been a few repairs. Um, looks like a and low pressure valve spindle that's been or spool that's been replaced looks like it's kind of fabricated uh, the high or the intermediate pressure valve it looks like they bored it out and re-sleeved it you can see the old holes here apparently somebody wasn't able to uh, figure that little thing out where you can bore something out smaller anyway they put a big huge thick sleeve in there for the valve and then a new valve um, looks like a new piston in the intermediate and then high pressure looks like it might be original valve looks like it's probably original it's not a very big valve but the ports have lots of space around them I don't know if you can see that uh, ports aren't straight like I thought or was hoping uh, they're kind of curvy uh, they got the bridge there in the middle of the port to support them uh, measured the bores and stroke. Um, pretty awesome. It's a six and or sorry, a four inch bore. The high pressure, six and a half inch bore. The low pressure, or intermediate pressure, and eleven inch bore. The the low pressure. So that's four, six and a half, and eleven by seven and a half inch stroke. I'd say that's pretty dang good. So uh, I'll do the plan formula with going for like a 200 PSI uh, pressure on the main steam, maybe 250, and see what we come up with that. Let's see the, the reversing lever in action here. I fumble around trying to try do something I need three hands for. And I'll run it back here. Okay. Throttle. This weird, funky uh, linkage. It works. Let's throttle. 
It's like a motorboat. Um, and it goes to this throttle valve. I'll see how positive it is and how how much it can be tuned or how much it sticks. Um, the cutoff for the stroke isn't really the infinitely adjustable like on a uh, a uh, something that's equipped with the Stevenson Link valve gear. But there's a lot fewer moving parts in the Stevenson Link. Um, so this is high speed, low drag, fast engine. Really exceptionally built, lots of bearing surface area on all the mains and lots of bearing surface on the rod bearings. Not a lot of uh, bearing loads on the valve gear because they're all piston valves, which is outstanding. Um, yeah, lightweight reciprocating parts. I'm assuming probably the, the pistons are lightweight also. I'd like to pull them out and see what they look like, see what their rings look like. Looks like I'd have to pull them from the top. I'm sorry, pull the pistons out from the top. Rods come out from the bottom only. Maybe get this on air or something and run it and get... And then steam, of course. But... I want to clean it up a little bit so I don't score bearings and stuff like that. Really running it hard. I know I turned it over a little bit, but that's different. Anyway, yeah, you can see there's definitely modern, modern parts here replacing whatever was there before. I'm willing to bet it was probably a shaft that went straight up, maybe adjacent to the throttle. And then uh, handles oriented a little bit differently. But whatever worked for whoever did this and restored it. I'm glad they saved it and did the work they did to to make it better. It's a beautiful engine. I don't know what this plumbing nightmare is, but we're gonna clean all that stuff up. Anyway, hope you enjoy it.